Hello, hello. Welcome to Possibility Project. Um, this is episode number 48, as you can see. And today we're talking about activating your inner futurist, how we can design the future quo. And that's a spin off of Tamika's business name, which I asked her permission. I'm like, it's just so good. Like it's, I love that. When I, when I um, learned about Tamika's work, I saw the name of her business and my my book being no more status quo. The idea of a future quo was just like so exciting and thrilling. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I have to meet Tamika. And then it was so wild because at around the same time, someone else said, oh, you have to meet this person, Tamika. And I thought this is the universe is like Tamika, 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 Tamika. So that's how this all started was a conversation with Tamika. She is very good friends with Grace and a co-conspirator collaborator with Grace. And then I read an amazing article by Hilda and I thought, okay, here we go. We're going to have a great group to have a wonderful conversation. So I'm so excited that you're here today. Um, and I also am just going to take a moment. I just learned about an hour ago that a friend of mine has passed away and he is one of the um, first like world builders and super imagination people that I've ever met. And his name was Sadiq Greenberg and he did pass away. And I just wanna honor him because he really shook up my thinking about what's possible. And I'll tell you a real quick story about Sadiq because I really wanna breathe life into the life that he shared with me. Um, we were presenting at the Board of Supervisors in our county and it was a startup that I was leading which was like a matchmaking service with nonprofits in the community. And it was called a wishlist hero. And I was wearing like a suit ready to present to these, you know, leaders, these local government officials. And he showed up dressed as a superhero. <laughs> he was wearing these neon green tights, like a fur vest of some kind, a face mask. I mean, I was so stunned and so alarmed, honestly, at what he was wearing to talk to these local government officials. But it also was so delightful and so different. And it just brought this, um, I don't know, this whole new feeling to the meeting. So I just want to share that memory of Sadiq and how he just continually shook up my thinking. And I love that it's so appropriate to what we're talking about today. Like, how do we reimagine what's possible? How do we imagine the future? And he was right there with it. So yeah, wish you Sadiq. Thank you everyone for letting me honor him in that way. So let's keep moving. If you are new to Possibility Project, this is the 48th episode, as I said. We have amazing other topics, amazing speakers. So you can check out any of those at possibilityproject.org and on the YouTube channel. And I'm going to refer to a couple different things, a couple different resources. So I want you to check those out. And I'm going to be pasting a Google Doc. I have them all in one Google Doc just to make it easier. And it's not filling up the chat. And it's hard for me to do that anyhow. So you'll see all of those in that one document if you want to follow up on anything that I have mentioned. So I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Heather Hiscox. My pronouns are, <coughs> excuse me, my pronouns are she, her. And I reside in Tucson, Arizona. And um, for anyone that's disabled uh, visually, I want to describe myself, my person. I have red hair, blue eyes, uh, light skin, freckles. I'm wearing like a green sweater. I'm in a blue room with lots of colorful arts behind me. Um, I'm coming to the land that was kept and held sacred by the Thona Altham and the Pascoyaki people. I honor these ancestral keepers of the land where I'm now living, and I honor their descendants who continue to breathe sacred life into our earth. And I want to just share a quick note on territory acknowledgments. They're just one small, small way of disrupting and dismantling colonial structures. If you want to learn more of how this lightly touches the surface of privilege and power, you can read more at Native Land Digital to find out the land that you occupy and go deeper. And as we learned about our indigenized social impact topic last time, our last episode, our speakers are talking about, yes, land acknowledgements are nice, but actually knowing and understanding the people of the land and where you live, the history and current life um, is really key and really important. So I encourage all of us to go deeper, to expand our knowledge and, and sharing of that. Um, and I also want to note with that in mind that many of our guests are U.S.-based and they do share a U.S.-based perspective, but we welcome thoughts and ideas and all and guests, of course, from all places and spaces. So I just want to point that out for all of our international friends that are watching and listening. I am the CEO and founder of Pause for Change, and I work with nonprofits, local governments, and philanthropic foundations 
to help them solve problems using a whole new problem solving um, skills called the pause framework that I created. You can learn more about that on my website and I'll put that link and you can connect with me on LinkedIn. But how Possibility Project started was in March of 2020 when the world was completely shifting. And then with the murders of George Floyd and so many others that were also happening in you know early to mid 2020 and continuously, um, it was such a time that my co-founder at the time, um, Devin Davey, we were reaching out to our network. We needed nourishment. We needed connection. We needed care. And we were having these really powerful conversations about what was possible. And we were just seeing things shifting, new conversations, new headlines, new things were happening. So instead of just having these conversations in a selfish way with just like our network virtually or in coffee shops, you know, snuck away in the corner. We really wanted to bring them to a community. So now there's almost 900 people in the LinkedIn group. There's thousands now on the mailing list. So we are a force. We are a community that get to have these conversations. So I'm so excited that you're here. And I hope you continue to listen to the previous and join the future. And as I mentioned, the future quo, I love it because the name of my book is No More Status Quo. You can check that out online, any online retailer to learn more about my framework. Um, but I want to touch upon the goals of, of Possibility Project. So the intentions behind this work are to unite a community of diverse change makers. Um, we want to stimulate new thinking and a thirst for deeper change, explore collaboratively what's possible. There's been beautiful connections that have happened between our speakers, between our guests, um, between you all that join. I mean, it's just fascinating what happens, but we really want to connect you all together. And then it starts with us. We all have to do the individual, personal, individual work. So we want to see what our role in transformation is really about. And like I said, we have to start with us before we can ripple out and make this change in a larger way. So here's the flow that we follow in Possibility Project. Um, our guests are going to introduce themselves in just a second. And we do introductions in a little bit different way. You saw their amazing bios in the reminder emails. So we have our guests, um, our speakers share a little story. So you hear a little story about them. And then we always have the same two prompts every single episode, all 48, unless it's a special workshop event. Um, what's dysfunctional related to the topic we're discussing today that you want to disappear and what's emerging that gives you hope. So we get to talk about what's messed up, how do we think we got there, and then what's possible moving forward. And then we will have Q&A time. So please put your questions in the chat. I'll keep, I'll keep an eye on those. Keep the chat active and lively, um, you know, build on what the speakers are saying, share resources, ideas, whatever it is that you want to contribute. We love it. Um, and then we'll have our takeaway at the very end to talk about what the next episode is all about. So I'm so excited for us to be together. And the, the why was really born from this idea of what does it mean to be a futurist? Who gets to be called a futurist? There, you know, there's some initiatives and efforts to professionalize and um, I don't know, kind of not restrict or control, but that might be part of it what it means to be a futurist, how you work in these um, sector in the sector and how these skills are applied. But we want to really dive into a different way of thinking about it. Like what if we all could be futurists? What if we all of course have the opportunity to design new systems and structures and practices? And what does that mean if all of us have that power? And what are some of the mindsets and skills and strategies we can learn and use to shift from status quo to future quo? So we're so excited to, to jump into that topic today. And I, I hope it was very enticing and that's why you're here. So we are so honored uh, to be in the presence of our amazing speakers today. Tamika Vasquez, Humanity Centered Futurist, Strategist, Professor, Speaker, and Founder of the Future Quo. Ilda Vega, Deputy Vice President of Philanthropic Practice at Hispanics and Philanthropy. And Grace Mervin, Artist, Designer, Strategist, and Futurist. It's great. So I'm going to stop sharing and I want to see if Hilda, can you kick us off and tell us your intro story and, and we'll get moving. Happy to kick us off. Thank you, Heather. And thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Hilda Vega. Um, I use she, her, a, a pronouns. I live in Northern Illinois, which is um, Antigua territory of the Fox people. And just um, since we were on the topic, I'm going to put in a resource for land back, um, which 
is another movement in space that kind of goes beyond land acknowledgements, but talks about ways that people can actually give back land if they're in a position to do so. Um, and other ideas for the rest of us to really think about what do we do beyond land acknowledgements and, and knowing the people who, uh, who this land was stolen from, but actually how do we move into a place where we're getting to repair. Um, and also, some of you probably live in a place where there is something like a shumi tax, where you can also contribute to different organizations that are led by indigenous folks. So I just want to recommend that folks dig in a little more deeply on that. Um, but I'll get into my my story, which is Heather said we are invited to tell stories about ourselves. Um, mine is ridiculous, but it's the only thing that came to my head since I was thinking the other day about April Fool's Day. And I, I remember it, and this is indicative of my personality, so just go along with me. Um, I remembered that many years ago, many jobs ago, um, my my folks at my organization, I decided to play a little joke on our boss. Um, she had a set of photos all over her office where she was with different people. She was with family members. She was with, you know, celebrities in Chicago. She was with you know, leading, um, you know, members of philanthropy in different spaces. And our admin person was very good at uh, Photoshop at the time. And so she went in and she replaced all of the photos with just completely random people like Sid Vicious, you know, just like the most random people you could possibly think of. And then we put them all back in the same place where they were. And it honestly took our boss maybe half a day to notice <laughs> that the photos were different and that there were different people in there. I'm going to be honest, she didn't take it well. Uh, she was not happy that we had done this. Um, there were maybe some swear words thrown around, um, but I, I, I consider it uh, probably a success of subtlety that we were able to do this. And she, she came around. Eventually she came around. This has very little to do with what we're talking about today, other than it's really important to like find the joy in these little things uh, and, and to just topic like futurism, which I think feels really heavy, sounds really heavy. There's also a lot of people who are invested in making it feel really heavy and unattainable. Um, so let's not keep it in that space where thinking about the future is unattainable or only for academics or people in a business or military space. Let's find the humor. Um, and we can swear a little bit and that's fine, but let's just remember to find the humor. Um, so with that, I will pass it back to Heather. Thanks. That's awesome. I love that. Yes, we have to have joy. We have to have tomfoolery. We have to have fun. And, and I love that you shared that story. Yeah, that's why I love these stories, because they can literally be about anything. And that if that if the topics don't entice you to watch past episodes of Possibility Project, you should just join at least for the stories. I mean, the stories are so interesting from our speakers. So thank you for sharing that. I love it. Grace, I would love for you to share your story next. Hi, yeah. Um, so I'm Grace. I live in Brooklyn, New York, which is Lenape land. Um, and the story that kind of popped into my head first, I guess, given the topic was sort of a little bit of, I guess, lore for how I uh, got into sort of the futurist world or worlds of futures. Um, I grew up in Northern California, and it's a beautiful area, um, Napa Valley, wine country, it's gorgeous, um, and it's also heavily impacted by climate change, so there are a lot of wildfires, and in 2017, there was this huge wildfire that um, just kind of decimated the area that I grew up in and uh, burned down my high school, a bunch of family friends lost their homes came within a mile of the house that I grew up in and it really impacted me deeply. Um, and at the time I was living in Portland, Oregon and it's it reminds me of when someone in your life passes away and you kind of have this moment where you're like, how is everybody around me so happy and living their lives as if everything's normal, you know? <laughs> Cause it's hard to, it, it really made me realize how understanding the impact of climate change is really hard unless it impacts you personally. Um, and I think that really spurred this moment where I was like, I really want to talk about what's happening. I want to talk about climate change. I want to have these conversations. And it tended to make people really uncomfortable and they didn't really want to do it. Um, and around that time, I read this Yale climate opinion poll where they polled a bunch of people in the U.S. And even though 72% of people polled believe that um, climate change is happening, 
and that it will harm future generations. Only 35% discussed it occasionally and only 25% heard about it once a week. So I uh, kind of ended up designing this weird uh, exhibit where I would pop up on the street and kind of ask people like, how do you feel about the future of our planet? And how do you kind of feel about what's happening? Um, and then on the other side of the kind of exhibit that I made, I would kind of prompt people to think about what um, what kind of future do you think we're headed towards and like, what would you ideally like it to be? And it's kind of funny because at the time I didn't know that what I was doing was futures work. I didn't even know that was a thing. Um, and I also didn't know about participatory design and that's also what I was doing. So I met some really cool uh, women who are speculative designers and futurists and they were kind of like hey you're doing this thing that is a thing that exists and you should kind of keep trying and here are all these people that you should look into and um, it ended up turning into this kind of bigger thing that I was facilitating when I lived in Portland and kind of led me then to move to New York to study at Parsons and get a little bit deeper into the futures field um, but I had this one uh, experience where I was facilitating the project and it was very like bright and colorful and there was this little boy with his mom who came up it attracted a lot of children because it was bright which wasn't the intention but um, he responded to every question thinking about like you know about how do you feel about the future as hopeless and scared and I think having that moment and seeing this little child who was so terrified about the future kind of made me feel like okay I'm on I have to do something about this and I'm on the right path if like this is a thing that's happening um so yeah I guess that was my my story <laughs> wow oh I love that story I I love how you just take action and you follow your gut and that instincts and then later you're like what I'm doing a thing it was it has a name and there's people that do this too and there's a community and I'm, I'm part of something larger and I didn't even know, right? I just thought I would do this thing. And then you found your people, right? I love that. I, I've had many of those experiences. There's like, what? There's other people hanging out, having fun, troll making. Yes, let's go. Oh, I love it. Thank you for sharing. Tamika, 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 take it away. For sure. Hey, everybody. It's so nice to see so many people interested in this topic. I'm humbled every time people raise their hand to learn more about this future space. Um, my story is probably pretty consistent with a lot of people who have been brought up in, in corporate spaces more specifically. And I think I had spent, just so you guys have some context, I had spent uh, 13 years or so in the tech industry and I never intended to work in the tech industry. I actually wanted to be a journalist. Um, my family immigrated to New York when I was a kid uh, from a country called Guyana in South America. And one of the things that you know happens to I think a lot of immigrant kids is this expectation that you will sort of make it right in in a country like the U.S. and from that create a pathway for other folks to come behind you to kind of emulate that path. And so there was always a lot of pressure to kind of figure things out. And I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be a writer because my my natural curiosity about the world suggested that I should probably learn tell stories about what I learn, interact with people and sort of move through the world in a very organic way. Um, but I was not raised with many means. And so as a result of that, entered into the business space where I found this career pathway that I didn't know existed in the tech industry. I didn't know you could be a non-technical person and work in the tech industry, but I ended up spending 13 years um, working for startups, working for multinational enterprises and it was cool. You know, it's, it's good exposure. It's good education. It's, it's great to see how your skill set as a more creatively inclined person could be translated into these career paths. But if I'm being totally honest, it was never for me. Um, and I just kind of kept going with it because that's what the last thing on my resume said. And you just pursue the next thing based on the last thing you did. And next thing, you know, you know, I sort of ended up in this very linear path. Um, Within that path, what I realized was like there was so much disconnection from not just, you know, my general interests professionally, but also from myself. And so I took a trip with my family to my birthplace, uh, Guyana. I was born in Guyana. So we we went back there for the first time in probably 11 years. So it was this like weird moment because you don't realize how much time has passed until there are people who are seeing you and 
wanting to know what you've been up to. And you realize like, wow, the last time we had this conversation, I was a completely different person, you know, with completely, a completely different reality. And so I was just kind of in this space of reconnecting with a lot of folks, a lot of people who are blood related or just friends of family, um, people who are part of this wider story that I share. Um, and it was weird. It was just strange to kind of observe myself from the outside view and see how far I had diverted from that path. Um, simultaneously, you know, I think the thing about any one of you who may have been exposed to the tech industry or work in that industry is you get this impression that somehow you are already in the future, right? Like you are already ahead of where the world is, is going. And it, it creates this weird um, sort of cognitive dissonance because you, you recognize that that is simply not true, right? The future is not singularly a story about technology and technology does not suggest or like advancing technology doesn't suggest that we are advancing civilization. And so it becomes this kind of moment of reckoning where you realize like, sure, I can talk a lot about shiny things. I can certainly, you know, go into the weeds on the possibilities of using technology, but what could I say about how that's going to create a different human experience? What could I say about the world that we're leaving behind? I don't know. What what could I say about the future, right? If if it's not rooted in those shiny things. Um, and so for me, I wanted to be able to figure out a way to enter this space of having a different conversation about the future, um, certainly one that was more human-centered, um, one that would allow someone like me to find a new path, a new calling, a new way to reconnect with who they really are um, and not who they sort of purport themselves to be and having to uphold, um, you know, the, the image and the identities that we do as professionals. Um, and so I'm still figuring it out, you know, but the last couple of years I launched this practice called the Future Quo. Um, and the idea there is that we could have a space to just antagonize and sort of interrogate status quo thinking and how that takes shape and how that creates futures that we don't intend. Um, and so part of that practice is going through these exercises with people, you know, participating in workshops and going out and doing lectures and, and writing and trying to get people to just ask themselves some new questions that maybe might yield some new answers that could create a whole new set of pathways for us as a collective in how we may envision what is possible for the future. Um, and so I play with a lot of prompts. I try to get people to open up because I'm practicing opening up myself. Um, and so as I'm sort of learning how to be vulnerable in that regard, I'm certainly encouraging other people to do the same. And so I come up with different prompts, different activities, different ways of just, again, interrogating the status quo, um, but also getting people to open up about their actual philosophy or their actual point of view. And so I try a few different prompts. Um, I'll try one with you all now if you're open to it. Um, I might try two questions and we'll do them really quickly just so you have an opportunity to just drop some thoughts into the chat and you can kind of get a teaser of, of the sort of questions that I ask. Um, so one of those questions is, and if you're open to it, just share your responses in the chat. You certainly don't have to, but it would, re it would be really nice to see where there might be some connections, where there might be some differences among us. Um, but one of the questions I ask is, you know, if there were, think about the youngest person in your family, anyone who you have any connection to, it could be your own child, it could be a, a younger cousin, anyone. Um, and if they were to come to you and ask you for an artifact that represents your lifetime, what would you give them? And it could be anything. It could be a physical item. It could be a, you know, sort of idea. It could be wisdom. It could be literally anything. But if there was an artifact that you believe best represented your lifetime, what would that be? I'll give you guys a few seconds to just drop your responses in the chat. These are so great. These are so, so interesting. I could certainly talk a lot about some of the responses here. You know, one thing I will say as you continue to contribute, and thank you for being open to this exercise. Um, one thing I'll say is I've been pleasantly surprised when I've run this exercise with people, and, you know, and you ask them other questions as well. So it's not the only question they're answering. So they have a lot swirling in their brain and 
a lot that they're thinking about. But one thing that always stuns me is how very rarely do people speak about this sort of technology and especially the sort of technical, like high tech phase that we're in now. Um, more often than not, people are sharing responses like a lot of what you have here, whether it's, you know, I, I've heard this response of the library card several times. It's so cool to me. Um, pictures, you know, uh, I've, I've heard people say passports or maps or things that I think really suggest where some of our values may lie. So thank you again for contributing. Um, the next question I'll ask you, and it'll be the final one. Again, this is just really meant to be a teaser for you all, um, is if you had a superpower. So if you think about the superheroes that you grew up with, um, the fantastical futures uh, or, or figures, I should say, people who embody these like otherworldly qualities. If you can think about a super a supernatural capability of sorts, um, a superpower that you believe would help you best navigate the future, what would it be? And same thing, just go ahead and drop it in the chat if you're comfortable. These are great. These are great. Thank you all for contributing and continue to drop them in as you think about it. These questions are sometimes they require some reflection and some, you know, some some space. And, and these are, again, just teasers for you. So thank you for participating. But I love that question. And I love the answers I tend to get from that question, because a lot of the times, again, similar to the last question, it suggests some of where our values lie. It suggests some of where we feel limitations um, subconsciously. And, you know, we're looking for these otherworldly qualities to really come to, to life in some way. Um, one of the most common responses that I tend to get to that question relate to, I think, what a couple of you shared here around like empathy. Um, it relates to this idea of healing. That seems to be one of the more pervasive responses that I get from a question like this. So again, thank you. Uh, hopefully that just gives you a, a little bit of an intro of my world. Oh, I love that. I love all of that. I, I wrote so many great things of what you're saying. And of course, I love antagonizing and interrogating the status quo, 100%. But I love how you you approach this work with humility. And like Grace showed and Hilda talked about as well, like it's for everyone. And we're all learning and we're all figuring out and we're all wandering through it. And we're here to support each other. And that, like you said, you're practicing opening up. So you're trying to create space for people to open up and think differently because we're all trying to learn how to do that. I love that so much. I'm wondering, Hilda, can you kick us off and answer that first provocation of what around this topic is dysfunctional and what do you want to disappear? Thank you. And I'm going to try to... Um limit myself around the the dysfunction because I, I am a big fan of dystopian fiction. So there's a lot that I could talk about. Um, and, and I do want to give a little bit of context for folks. Um, I work at an organization called Hispanics and Philanthropy. Um, so not a place where we would traditionally do futurism, but it has been coming up in our work over the past few years. Um, and, you know, for me, this is a topic that comes from a few jobs ago, really learning about cosmovisions from across the Americas and what does that mean? And kind of thinking about ancestors who've been envisioning futures, you know, since the very beginning of time, right? And so then well, what does that mean for our people right now, especially across Latina and indigenous communities? And what are some of the practices and the values and the ideas that we can try to sustain and for many of us to recover um, the things that were taken from us so that we can think about futures in a more holistic and inclusive way as a practice, right? Like I, you know, we talked about this by email at the very beginning, Heather, like I don't consider myself a futurist. This is something that I'm learning about and something that I'm trying to figure out how to practice and what are the right questions to ask and and what does it mean for people who have traditionally been left out of conversations about futurism. Um, so so some of this is already touching on, on where I see the dysfunctions, right? And, and in particular where it overlaps with 
philanthropy. And there's a lot of parallels here in the sense of who's included and who's not included. Um, and so for me, when I hear about other people and their experiences uh, working on futures and scenario planning and, and different tools that come into this space, um, it, it's very similar to when I hear about philanthropy and the challenges of philanthropy of who's invited, who's not invited, who's centered in a certain way in the sense of maybe tokenized, um, but not really part of decision making, not really part of planning, not really part of, of the steps that take place to move forward on a lot of decision making. And so for me, um, those are core challenges to many of us in this work of how can we think about envisioning a future, which many of us in philanthropy do, right? We have our mission statements, we have our vision statements, we do, you know, some long-term thinking with some consultants. Um, and a lot of the times when we suddenly think about it, that, that vision is broad or generic, or it has this sort of kind of Benetton ad view of the world with very little practicality to how we get there, right? You know, what does it take to actually be in this place and in this space as a multiracial society, as communities that really are open to um, to principle disagreement and to the kinds of dialogues that we're having a hard time with right now. Um, and then a another piece that might sound a little bit strange, but there's this short sightedness that happens. Um, and, and I think maybe, Heather, this is the piece that I wrote where I, I talked about being in a couple of events that were about scenario planning and futurism. And what I was troubled with was that, and this was mostly with people who work in philanthropy, but also with people who work in government, is that we were being asked to plan out and think about 50 years down the road, but we very much got bogged down as groups about, okay, but this is the thing that needs to happen today. This is the thing that needs to happen tomorrow. Um, and you know, in particular in philanthropy, we love to set these time limits. You know, We want the grant report in a year. We are gonna do this strategy for three years or five years, and then we're gonna move on to something else. You know, it's really hard to have that as a practice when you're trying to affect systems change. Like th those two things are not compatible. Um, so, I mean, I think dysfunction is perhaps a light word for that particular challenge. Um, you know, the other piece that I wanted to touch on that relates to all of this is, um, is moving into the place of practice. Uh, and, and the ways that sometimes we also set ourselves up, and I'll include myself in this, you know, we kind of set ourselves up, not necessarily for failure, but we set ourselves up for destruction. Um, because it sounds very big, it sounds overwhelming. Um, and, and also, of course, you know, we, we get kind of bogged down by our very... <laughs> challenging day-to-day -day realities. You know, we, we know that there is a lot going on. We are, you know, in a, a world and a society where we are trying to cope with, you know, the starvation of children and the, you know, death of our planet and a lot of other really painful things that are part of our everyday. So how do we put ourselves also in a psychological position where thinking about the future is something that can help us think about hope and how do we break that down into little pieces or tiny habits or you know there's a lot of different ways that we can that we can break those little pieces up so that we feel like there's progress and that we can sustain ourselves for the long term um and and we have to do this collectively it's really hard for me to say well i can do this and sustain myself and somehow it's we can do this alone like this has to be a collective project um so so for me those are the three pieces that i think are deeply challenging for us, but then also there's a lot of pocket of opportunity in there. And so, but I'll save that for for the uh, the next conversation. Oh, I love what you shared. Yes, and dysfunction is the light way to say it. And we welcome all cursing on <laughs> this show. If there's anything that you're like, ah, yeah, I so many great examples of in this speaker chat. Lots of cursing, but the people try to hold back sometimes during the live the live part. But it's all welcome. Yeah, I love what you're saying about. Um, the short-sightedness in futurism practice like oh that how much that tension is there I love that I mean I think that could be a whole article and a whole deep dive into that topic of how are we limited based on our ways of thinking right now and then how do we really do systems change when we're like you have six months 
good luck to you, right? And you have accountability and all these structures to make ourselves feel better. And like we have control knowing that the world is crumbling around us in many ways. Yeah, thank you for bringing those to light. Really important. Grace, I want to hear about you. What are some of the dysfunctions that that stick out to you and, and make you want to curse? <laughs> oh, I have a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, yeah. As I was uh, thinking about the prompt, the main thing that kind of came up for me was um, this idea that especially in the global north, especially in like dominant culture, there's the common perception that there's this one future and that it's inevitable and that there's not much that any of us can do to shift impact or change that at all. When in reality, there's this saying in the futures field, I don't know like who this quote is attributed to, but there's this idea that there isn't a future, there's many possible futures. Um, and you know, this comes up a lot, like when you Google search the future, you get flying cars, shiny urban landscapes, maybe a vertical garden or two, um, but like, it just frustrates me because I'm like, there's so much else that it could be. And, um, you know, we tend to get these kind of popular representations of the future that are either this kind of shiny techno utopia, um, which I feel very is very is like kind of dystopian to me, or these sort of Blade Runner dystopias where everything's kind of like in LA, and it's red skies, and it's kind of raining all the time. Um, kind of perpetuating this idea that like everything's either going to be kind of terrible or it's going to be shiny and tech is going to save us. Um, and I don't think this is like a realistic dichotomy. Um, and I think something that we need to be kind of aware of is like, where are these ideas coming from? Where are these images coming from? Um, a lot of them sort of spawned in like post-World War II thinking about how do we kind of sell people more products and like ramp up consumerism? We sell this kind of shiny utopia that, and, and then here are all the products that can kind of get you there or something. And we see so much of it, like there's this example of in Blade, uh, in Minority Report, they were, were, Tom Cruise is like using a gestural interface and he kept having to take breaks because his arms were getting so tired and um, it just wasn't like a realistic, uh, thing, but so many uh, like tech companies have invested in trying to make gestural interfaces a real thing because this idea of the gestural interface uh, has become embedded in our collective consciousness. <laughs> like that is the future, you know, is flying cars and gestural interfaces. Um, so I think it's like, it's frustrating because so many people just kind of have this subconscious idea of like okay that's the inevitable future that's ahead of me without necessarily like being aware that they're holding on to this idea and there's theorists who kind of say you know we're having an imagination crisis and there's this crisis of the imagination where we've sort of lost our capacity in a lot of ways I think especially in the global north to like imagine things beyond um this sort of vague idea of the future that we're kind of holding subconsciously um and you know some people really dispute this and i think that's totally fair and i but i do see a lot of a lot of this um imagination crisis in the work i do and the people i talk to um because there's this quote you know i forget who it's attributed to again but uh, that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism and in my work i it's like, it's kind of true. Like, it's really hard to imagine what a future outside of capitalism could be or a future outside of this sort of techno dystopia um, or a future outside of this kind of uh, Blade Runner thing. Um, and I think, yeah, I'm ready for it to disappear and I'm ready for it to kind of make room for a plurality of different types of futures from different kinds of people. Um, so that we can kind of build a more realistic or more like diverse image of what possible futures can look like. Because um, I would argue that everyone here is engaging in some kind of future building in some way, shape or form. Even if you're kind of like planning a product that's gonna be released or something, you're, you're taking part in building the future. And um, yeah, I don't know, there's, yeah. <laughs> You are so right. Yes, that dichotomy of, yeah, that shiny tech of like perfectly manicured grass or greenery of some kind, like floating cars and like the, the sky is clear <laughs> and all those things. And then the other is like gray, rain, 
every, everything seems gray and like concrete everywhere. And you're totally right. Yeah, it's so interesting. And I, I also see that with how do you imagine the end of the world versus end of capitalism and your connections to consumerism, I think, are really spot on. Of like you can buy your way, you can acquire your way, you can you can launch your way to all these different futures. But mm, there's so much more, like you said, the pluriverse, the pluriverse, and all those opportunities and and the cosmo visions that Hilda talked about. Like there's so much more that we can possibly comprehend, right? And how do we tap into that to to shift our our awareness? And I love what the quotes and uh, resources that are in the chat. So keep those going. Thank you so much. Tamika, I want to hear from you. What are what are those dysfunctions you want to disappear? Yeah, I mean, I, I just appreciate um so much of what Hilda and Grace shared. I mean, there there's just so much um overlap that I could probably provide um from the short termism that Hilda was talking about and you know, a lot of just kind of the techno optimism that Grace is talking about. I mean, these are these really are some of these. Um, practices and norms that I am really hoping that the likes of us on this call are dead set on disrupting and changing and and evolving from. I guess for me, beyond you know what my colleagues already shared, I think one of the things I try to encourage people to keep in mind is the future is not a time or place. Um, it's not a singular destination, kind of like what Grace was sharing, right? It's not a a thing that we're going to arrive to. Um, it's a participatory space. And I think based on that, anyone who is a willing participant in that space, I consider them to be a futurist. I consider them to be anyone who's thinking about a world that we do not yet have, I think is a futurist, right? So I think one, one of the dysfunctions that um, I've come across in this work is who gets to call themselves that, um, who gets to participate in conversations pertaining to the future, who gets to think about it and talk about it. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of elitism surrounding that, you know, and I'm also saying this as a person who's gotten the formal training and did the things, you know, I checked the boxes, but when all is said and done, the people like Harriet Tubman to me as a futurist, you know, the people that are um, really participating in the work in the ways that I think enliven me and excite me and energize me are people who are just, you know, activists and, and, and creatives and, you know, folks working in, in civil service and trying to just get people to take simple steps that they understand will chart the course to a, a better future for us all. Um, and so I'm, I'm really, hell bent on making sure that people feel like they have a role to play and they have a right to play in how the story of the future pans out. Um, so again, you know, future is not this time and place. It's a space and it's the space that we're occupying. Um, I think another gripe that I sort of have is we get caught up talking about the future of things. Um, and again, as I shared in the intro, I come from a tech background. So like, most of the time I was paid to talk about things, right? Um, but what I'm far more interested in is not necessarily what's happening around us in terms of new products or, you know, new services or um, all of those things. What I'm more interested in is like, what's actually happening within us? Because I think the world that I, I remember years ago sitting at this round table um, with some folks on a board for a company that I was working with at the time. And somebody said, on the board that most of life happens between your ears. And I would never forget that because, you know, he was sort of saying this to suggest that there are just the stories we tell ourselves that then become manifestations in various shapes and forms. And I think when we keep these conversations going around things and just, you know, what's happening with this thing or that thing, this thing got released, like, well, how is that going to create the future? I think we miss an opportunity to really talk about what's actually happening within us you know, what is actually happening to the human experience? Are we actually trending towards a direction that we could be proud of? Are we going to be good ancestors on the other side of that? Like, we can't get caught up in things in lieu of actual life happenings and life experiences, the things that are happening between our ears, the stories that we get to tell ourselves, the belief systems that we adhere to, you know, and the norms that we get to shape as a result. So I'm, I'm really 
um, connected to more than I've ever been just the idea of who gets to think and talk about the future, you know, and, and who gets to really, how can we dig into what is happening within us as people and use that as a starting point to create, you know, all the questions that you all answered earlier, that that's a great starting point to me because that points to things that I otherwise would not learn about you or understand about you. And it's through those kinds of connections, seeing the things that we have in common, like seeing all the quirky, interesting things that you come up with in response to questions like that, that signals to me a healthier starting point for how we can then start to design, whether it is a product or, you know, whether it is a new organization that you're creating or a new system that you're trying to to, to mold, um, that's what's going to signal to us where we can begin and where where hope can really lie. Um, you know, the last thing I'll say is the other thing I have gripe with is uh, if you look at, you know, the S&P Global, so companies that are the most profitable, powerful companies in the world, a lot of them, it's something like, I don't know, 30 percent. It's a pretty significant percentage of them that have statements of purpose um, but when you dig into the ones that actually identify as purpose driven or can comfortably say that they practice what they preach, that number goes down to about 5%. Um, and I think there's something there because, you know, I, I come from a corporate background professionally. And so I am interested in seeing the ways that we can move away from just writing mission statements and actually practicing what we preach, upholding the ideals that we put on paper. So I'll, I'll close it there, but I think those are some of the areas that I certainly want to disappear. Oh, I love that. I love that. And yes, the, the focus on like the elitism and, and the structure around it, and, and you know, this comes up in design as well. How do we, how do we professionalize? How we do, how do we do this? But what, what is sacrifice? What does that mean? What, what is a part of that process? Um, I think you speak to that and the role in right to create this story. I mean, that's justice, right? The role and right to participate fully in the designing of our futures, our collective future, our individual futures. That's justice, that's power, that's privilege, that's so connected to systems and structures, right? We can't just talk about futurism as something that's disconnected from our collective humanity. And I think that's what you spoke to is the humanity. You want the humanity to exist in futures because that's what it's about. We're here to to care for ourselves, but really care for the collective. So I thank you for speaking about that. Oh, so good. So good. Well, let's spend a little bit of time. We, we always shift gears. So our brains, we've talked about the gripes, which we have to do. And it's like going to church for me. It's like preach. Yes. Thank you. I am nourished by your words and validation. And I don't want to go home and cry. So <laughs> we want to talk about Where's the hope? Because that's what I think about futures. Like that's a hopeful for me. That's there's reality, but there's truth, and there's there's truth in the possibility. So Hilda, I want to hear about what gives you hope. What's emerging? What are you seeing, doing, learning, um, experiencing, imagining that you can share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and want to appreciate everything that Grace and Tamika have shared. And and definitely when I think about not just the future, but about the right now and, and justice and liberation, I mean, art is a fundamental part of that expression and, and that work forward. Um, and, and in fact, it is one of those spaces where, and I wouldn't necessarily say that a lot of these things are emerging, maybe some things are emerging, um, and maybe that's more in the tech space, but a lot of what people think of right now as like emerging ideas or solutions have been around for a long time. Um, so I want to name that because people have been doing a lot of hard work to try to kind of move us along as societies, and it just doesn't it doesn't bubble up, it doesn't catch on, it's, it's not commercial or sellable or, you know, whatever the trajectory may have been. Um, so I want to be thoughtful about, you know, emerging versus just not being heard right um and and so for me the growing attention at least to you know this idea of being a good ancestor and thinking about who we are as ancestors which is a concept that i love and is really important um i think is something that is expanding and really important for us to to think about and to examine and and again to kind of go back to practice and what does this mean and practice like what does this mean for me um and and in particular for me you know i i don't have children but so what does this mean for you know people who were part of my my you know my blood family or my chosen family like many many years down the line like what am i leaving for them especially in a place 
like philanthropy, which is, you know, fuzzy and not very transparent and um, where things shift really, really quickly. And the focus is on people like, you know, Bezos and Bill Gates and, you know, people who's like, wealth and influence I'm never going to come close to but what what can I leave behind and where do I leave it in in small ways um and so I think these sort of approaches and um and conversations about what do we leave behind in lots of different ways I think are really important for thinking about a future that is practical and manageable and is something that we can navigate and think about every day and I appreciate more and more conversation happening about that lately um I also think that the the growing connection and almost the default of like the future is a, a multiracial place, like a multiracial, non-gender, very dynamic place is not something that I heard of when I was growing up. And so it's, I think it's really important to continue to bring that into spaces and conversations um, because uh, you know like folks were saying there there's this idea that the future is things and objects and um like you know living on space colonies but we're just going to be perpetuating the same thing if we're not talking about the people who are driving to make that happen and making it happen in that inclusive and just and truly sustainable way um I would also love for us to not have to live on other planets because we somehow figured out how to save this one. That would be nice. Um, um, and then I think the other piece that I, I wanted to bring up that is interesting to me and and has like little bubbles of hope is that there's lots of different ideas people are bringing to this conversation. So there's I I, mean, I only just heard about the the work of Protopia the other day. Like I've only just learned about this. Um, and so what I like about it is that there seems to be a lot of space in, in, in that work for having disagreements because people ha are coming at it um, from different experiences, but it seems like more of a place where people are willing to disagree, but sort of think about the big picture at the end of the day. Um, so, so what I wanted to tease out and what I think is useful about, the, you know, bringing up a topic like protopia um, is not that it's a cute little word, which it is, but, um, but that intentionally creating spaces to disagree and to be okay with an idea of multiple approaches to multiple futures because we're you know we are bringing multiple ideas from across many 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 communities um so we happen to share a planet but that's you know but that is you know like a small piece of it right because we all have our part to play in this um so how do I want to summarize this? I think it's kind of the little pieces. Maybe what I'm really saying, big picture across these examples, is, is that it's all of the little pieces that we can bring into the conversation to be able to invite others in, to be able to have conversations with people who maybe we would not spend time talking to, but we all have a vested interest in leaving behind something, leaving behind a planet, leaving behind a livable planet, leaving behind the things that we want that we know we're never going to see. Oh, thank you. And thinking about yeah, how to be a good ancestor, I think is so key because it wraps up so many things that you talked about. What do I leave behind as an individual? Like literally in the space that I occupy, the land that I occupy, the communities that I participate in, the families that I create, you know, blood and chosen, right? It's like, that's where we have the power and the agency. And then how do we collectively come together with those different visions and, and provide space for lots of different ideas? And I mean, conflict is so generative. If it's if it's done in a way that's, you know, empathetic and respectful and, you know, focus on shared liberation. Yeah, absolutely. Such good points. Grace, what's given you hope? Yeah, Um I also love the, this idea of protopia, and that's something that I really wanted to talk about and share. Uh, Monica Bielskite is kind of one of the um, thought leaders in this space that I'm really, I really resonate with her work. Um, and I love this emphasis on the kind of messy middle between utopia and dystopia, that, that it's like, we don't live in a binary world, and um, we're not going to live in a binary future. And there's so many there's so much richness in that in-between space and there's, you know, movements like solar punk 
um, which kind of emphasize the ability of humans to thrive despite the impact that climate change will have on our planet. And there are these spaces like Protopia where we can really like grapple with the kind of messy realities of people disagreeing and um, having to like deal with this, the reality of the world that we have right now while also building room for it to change or get better in some ways. Um, and I really love this idea of kind of imagining the future is a way of kind of prototyping it, um, like rehearsing what we want to happen and be intentional about it. Um, in academia, they use the word prefiguring a lot or kind of like practicing things in order to kind of um, prefigure them in the future, shaping them intentionally as they emerge. Um, and also kind of, as Hilda mentioned, like intentionally hospicing or like letting intentionally letting things die, you know, thinking about what parts of this don't we want to come with us, um, as well as what do we want to be here. Um, and another thing that really gives me hope is organizations that like, I just see so many little futures organizations popping up and like, I love being a part of the future quo with um, Tamika and there's this other organization called Radar that I'm a part of. And there's so many people that are really democratizing the field of futures or aspiring to democratize it. And instead of keeping a lot of these methods in silos, it's kind of how do we share this way of thinking um, with as many people as possible to kind of populate these images of the future with more people from more diverse backgrounds and with kind of different types of ideas instead of instead of it being a very like homogenized space. And because there are so many, there is such a rich diversity of ideas of what the future could be out there, but they're not necessarily have, they don't necessarily have the same platform or the same kind of, it's like harder to find them in um, kind of a lot of the traditional spaces that a lot of these ideas are held. So I think like as the future field begins to expand and democratize and um, disseminate more types of people are being exposed to this way of thinking and feeling empowered to kind of like really think for themselves, like what does the future look like for me and my community? Um, and people who have already been doing this thinking are kind of having more opportunities to sort of share the way that they're, they've been thinking already, but that we ne haven't necessarily been exposed to. And it's kind of expanding from something that has been kind of predominantly white and global northy to something that's more complex and diverse, which really represents the reality of kind of the planet that we're living on, um, which is really exciting to me. And it's exciting for me to kind of get to be a part of the space and to kind of see all this stuff happening and emerging these conversations happening. And that's really what's giving me hope right now. I love that. And in the chat, could you put, I know that um, Taylor had put the Bay Area solar punks, which is, I cannot wait to dive in to learn more about solar punks. Thanks, Taylor. But if you could put a link to Monica's work, I think that would be helpful for folks. So there's like a main landing page that we can all go to. Um, yes, the the openness of what's possible. And like you said, beyond the like majority white global Northy perspectives, like what what is happening? What is out there? You're making me think of just so many questions, but I, I will hold on to those for now. And then the intentional hospicing, um, yeah, like choosing what what can go, what can expire, right? Tamika, I want to hear from you. What's giving you hope? Yeah, I think um, this is probably a really ironic thing to say, but what gives me hope is this deep discomfort that we're in right now. I think um, there's a cultural historian who I'm not recalling right now uh, that was referenced in a book I'm reading called Imagination by a sociologist um, named Ruha Benjamin. Uh, she references this cultural historian and the way he captured the moment we're in is that we're living in between stories. And I thought it was just a great capture and it's it's stuck with me because while this space is extremely uncomfortable, you know, while there's just just so many trending topics, so much to contend with, so many questions, so much uncertainty. While all that is happening, it just gives me a lot of hope because I'm like, if we don't know what is happening and we don't we don't know where we're going per se, that means everything is fair game. That means that people like us on this call have every right to introduce new thought, to get people on board with new ideas, 
um, to reconnect back to our, our roots, to acknowledge, you know, ancestries of the lands that we're on, um, to tap into creativity, to be more connected and embodied with nature. Like everything is fair game right now. And that gives me a lot of hope because I think particularly for me as a person who's going through a, a career transition, trying to find my way in this space, I think it really shows me that I mean, there's there's really no limit to what might be possible. You know, what could be, what should be. I can ask myself those idealistic questions and it's okay because there is no blueprint for the time that we are in right now. So it sounds ironic, but that does give me a lot of hope. Um, I think people who are working in spaces that are invested in the human experience give me a lot of hope. You know, people who are out there, wellness practitioners, um, you know, people who care about the mental well-being of our, our fellow humans and, and are creating more resources and more access for people to really understand what's happening within them and how they can show up in the ways that they intend to. Um, you know, people who are looking at ethics and, you know, particularly folks that are challenging some of the practices that are happening right now with like artificial intelligence and all those spaces. You know, I will say that um, in 2015, I completed a master's thesis that was focused on the impact and opportunities of AI. And it was an awkward time because nobody really wanted to talk about this. You know, I think I don't remember what was really trending and buzzing at the time, but it was not AI. Um, and it's so weird to see that, you know, when something becomes a trending topic, how heightened it can be. But at the same time, because it's so heightened, because it's so loud, it's allowing you know, that sort of contrarian thinking, a healthy amount of contrarian thinking to happen where people are like, okay, if this thing really does become normalized and integrated in our world in the ways that we are seeing it already start to, but also uh, supposing that it could, what do we want on the other side of that? And who gets to say what good looks like? And is is this world of better, faster, cheaper at the sacrifice of human talent really worth it. And all those folks that are really um, just asking the right questions, you know, and standing up and defending the sort of ethical code that I think has carried humanity for hundreds of thousands of years, the understanding that we cannot do something that is not with the greater good in mind. Like those people give me so much hope. Um, I think storytellers, artists, they continue to give me hope, especially people who are looking at um, public art in particular, just like the spaces that we share and we occupy together and the ways that the monuments that we put up and, you know, the things that we commemorate in public spaces really says a lot about us. You know, you could tell a lot about a country based on who's on the money and whose names are on the highways and, you know, whose monuments are being put up in these spaces. And so people that are really looking at how can we start to redesign and reimagine public life through these spaces, like, I'm I'm rambling and kind of giving you guys a lot to think about, but these are the spaces and topics that give me a lot of hope. Um, and I think just this emergence of futures thinking as a practice, you know, again, as I shared before, I don't think you need to become certified in foresight and, and the sort of um, frameworks or methodologies to consider yourself a futurist and to really take part in this work. Um, and so people who are starting to integrate, you know, futures thinking as a practice. And what I mean by futures thinking is like speculation, imagination, looking at ways that we could ask different questions. Like anyone who's integrating that into their work is giving me a lot of hope because one, it creates more spaces for us to have conversations like this. Um, but two, it's on the other side of that. It's just going to produce better work, more qualitative, deeper humanity forward type of work. And that is exciting to me. And it's, it's very hopeful to me. So again, you know, this shift that we're in this discomfort that we're in, I think is an opportunity. And that's what I'm trying to hold on to in these times. Oh, I love that. Yes. Yeah, so many like fair game. I, I, I always think of that. And that's like, that was the genesis of possibility project. Like everything's fair game it's all crumbling. Like the truth is coming out. Reality is being present. Like people are noticing things. They're talking about things. Let's go. And I love that you've spoken to that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's time. It's time for anything we want. It's time to imagine anything we can. Okay. So April 25th, um, we'll have a 90 minute workshop with Stephanie and Katie from Future Work Design. 
and they're also part of the Either Org project. And if you have not heard about this, you have got to join or at least watch the recording. There is a collective, I think more than 400 people from all over the planet that have come together to create this searchable open source database where you can look for organizational design tools, case studies, stories, narratives, examples, people to connect with. And they're going to teach us how to play in the database. Um, Stephanie has given me a tutorial. We played a little bit, it's very fun. So it's a special event. It has all these amazing like radial buttons and things you can click on click to reveal all these opportunities for learning and connections. So please try to join on the 25th. And then related to our topic today, and we talked about AI, um, mid-May, we're still we're still zhuzhing the dates a little bit. Um, Shijuade Kadri and Dai Ding, and thank you, Amy Wilson, for connecting me with both of those lovely people. Amy, yay. Um, they're going to be talking about AI and the harm connected to social impact specifically. So we're going to dive deep into that topic. So that'll be mid-May. You'll get all the emails about all future episodes because you registered for today. So um, yeah, and Amy's on the guiding council of either org. So she's a great resource to reach out to, but please join. But I want to turn back to our speakers and I want you each to share some parting thoughts or words with us. What do you want to leave us with? What's a, a nugget that popped up during your, your chat? Um, what's something you're thinking of that you want us to continue to be inspired by? Hilda, do you want to take us away? Sure. Yeah. And I, I just appreciate everybody who was on this conversation from the very beginning and all the ideas that folks have been sharing. Um, I think especially for me being in a very kind of particular world of philanthropy, seeing a lot of these other ideas that I wouldn't normally come across has been incredibly valuable for me. So I really appreciate that from everyone. Um, and in terms of what I'm taking away in a, a little nugget that I want to leave behind is that um, I'm also a big fan of the NAP ministry. I am Trisha Hersey. And so just want to leave behind this idea that rest and procrastination are not bad things and that these are actually the places where we can, or at least for me, I'm very, very creative when I am not doing anything or when I'm just taking a walk or I'm just sitting in a museum, like staring off into space. Those are my moments. Um, so I want to encourage everyone to, to do all the things that are, um, non-capitalist there's there's this little statement of like how can i be useless to capitalism today and i think that is really important to hold on to so that we can actually do the other things that we really want to do oh, i love that okay what's the t-shirt we all need to buy now how can i be useless to capitalism today yes that's great <laughs> uh, grace what would you leave us with yeah um I'm so excited. All this conversation is making me really happy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think like in the name of kind of being useless to capitalism and kind of thinking about what's beyond capitalism, I would encourage people to sort of um, poke at their kind of imagined image of the future in their minds and kind of um, pull on some threads and sort of question it and also maybe like um, plant some seeds or dig a little bit and spend some time kind of really thinking about how can you Kind of plant this other type of garden in your imaginary future mind you know of other things that could be and seek out maybe different types of um, future imaginaries and things of that nature but um, there's this quote that I, I was looking at today by Raymond Williams and it says to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing and I think that's something that like I'd love to just sort of plant in your little <laughs> future garden if I could so yeah Grace, will you put that in the chat? I want to make sure I include that in the email. That's beautiful. I love it. Tamika, final word. Take us away. Final word. Um, I think, you know, we've all been on airplanes where they say to put on your oxygen mask first before helping someone else in a state of emergency. I think uh, that doesn't only apply to a state of emergency. I think that also applies in life and particularly for those of us that are doing this work in the future space, we we have to take care of ourselves first in the sense that um, similar to what Hilda was saying, you know, things like rest, things like rejuvenation, things like mental well-being practices, uh, we are consuming a lot. And I don't take that lightly. So part of how we're going to be able to create new pathways forward and tell new stories and energize other people in this work is by making sure that 
our our needs are are taken care of. So I just encourage you all to continue to take care of yourself. And I also encourage you to embrace complexity. There's an author um, by the name of Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He wrote uh, some work around this idea of black swans. So for those of you who are familiar with that futurist concept, it's this idea of a random, crazy, out of nowhere event that sort of shakes up our reality. Uh, we've experienced quite a few of those in, in the past few years. Um, but he talks about this notion of simplification being dangerous. Um, it is more dangerous for us to try to have singular answers and overly simplify. It is far more encouraging and far more uh, daring and worthwhile to embrace complexity. And so I want to leave you all with that, that while things feel very complex right now, uh, it again, it, it's just opportunistic for us to be able to live in this time where we get to create uh, new realities for ourselves. Wonderful. Uh, great parting words. I love it. Thank you all for being here and for participating and absorbing and integrating all that you've learned and heard. And I really hope you'll come back in a couple weeks um, in late April for that awesome workshop where you get to learn about this great tool. And you can watch the recording as well if it's not convenient. And hopefully you'll come back in May for the AI focused um, session. We will take June and July off. And then back in August for the rest of the year with amazing topics and amazing speakers. I am so in the flow right now with Possibility Project. Things are just popping into place. Beautiful humans are coming into my world. Great topics are emerging. So please stay involved and be stimulated and invigorated and energized for future conversations. Thank you so much to Mika and Grace and Hilda and to all of you. And you'll get a follow-up email on just a couple of days with a recording and all of these beautiful resources from the chat and from our speakers. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Take good care.